Susan Rainwater was a 66-year-old woman who lived with her husband in Eatonville, Washington. On August 9, 2019, Susan left her home to take a bike ride on State Route 7, leaving from 320th Street East. However, she never came back home. Later that day, a local found her mangled bicycle in the grass. When he looked closer, he found Susan's body in a ditch nearby. She appeared to have been the victim of a hit and run. The only clue investigators could find at the scene was a small black piece of plastic, which had seemingly broken off from the car during the collision. The investigators urged the public to help find the driver and posted a photo of the broken car part on Twitter. The next day, the photo made its way onto the object identification subreddit called r what is this thing? Soon, the post had garnered hundreds of comments from car enthusiasts and mechanics alike, trying to figure out the model of the car. Impassioned by the heinous nature of the crime and the callousness of the coward who drove off after striking Susan, leaving her for dead, people from all over the world joined in on the search. One of the comments was from a user who goes by the username Jeff's Nuts, possibly an almond or cashew enthusiast who said that he was a former vehicle inspector for the state of Maryland. He was able to accurately identify the black plastic piece to be that of a headlight bezel, which came from a 1980s Chevy truck. Soon, the police received an anonymous tip about a 1986 Chevrolet K10 pickup truck, which had its front end damaged to the right headlight area. The caller also gave the police a license plate number. A quick check led the investigators to the address of a 37-year-old Jeremy Simon. After three days of questioning, Jeremy finally admitted to hitting Susan and then fleeing the scene. Jeremy later told police that on the morning he hit Susan, he had been very tired, as he had worked late the night before and had only had four hours of sleep. While he was driving, he claims he fell asleep at the wheel and hit what he says he thought was a mailbox. But when he looked back and found he had hit a cyclist, he said he panicked and fled the scene, leaving Susan with no medical aid. Jeremy was detained and found to be in possession of heroin during his arrest. He pleaded guilty in court and was sentenced to only four and a half years in prison as part of a drug offender sentencing alternative. The program allows drug addicts to serve half their sentence in prison and the other half on probation as long as they follow a mandated drug rehabilitation program. Unfortunately, 66-year-old Susan was not given such lenient courtesy. Carolee Ashby was a four-year-old girl who lived with her parents in Fulton, New York. On the night of Halloween 1968, Carolee was out walking with her older sister, Darlene. They were heading back home after buying some candles for Darlene's upcoming birthday party when a speeding car hit and killed Carolee while the girls were trying to cross the street. Witnesses' accounts described the car to be a 1962 Buick. The police interviewed several people, but none were ever charged. The driver was never caught. The case would go cold and would remain that way for 44 years. Then, in 2012, retired police officer Russ Johnson decided to post the case details on Facebook in hopes of receiving any tips to help find the murderous driver. Soon, a woman who was raised in Fulton, New York, came forward and told the police that on Halloween night in 1968, a member of the Parkhurst family asked her to say that she had been with Douglas Parkhurst that evening. The woman refused to cooperate and told police she didn't know why she had been asked to lie, but assumed it had to do with Carolee's death. Douglas Parkhurst was actually interviewed in 1968 after an anonymous tip received by the police led them to him. The tipster told police that the then 18-year-old Douglas Parkhurst had had an accident on Halloween night with a 1962 tan Buick. The police questioned him for over two hours, and while Douglas admitted that he had been in an accident that night, he claimed to have only hit a guard post and denied ever hitting Carolee. Police were unconvinced by his story, but never followed up with him, and the case would soon grow cold. 
More than 40 years later, after receiving the tip from the woman in 2013, police interviewed Douglas several times, and he eventually admitted to hitting Carolee with his car back in 1968. He told police that he had consumed alcohol that night, and while driving through Fulton, he had hit something, but had thought it was an animal and didn't stop to look. He claims it was only later that he realized he had hit a little girl. Unfortunately, even though Douglas confessed, he could not be charged, as the statute of limitations for vehicular manslaughter had already expired. After the confession, Douglas moved from Fulton and relocated to Maine. In a strange twist of fate, in 2018, Douglas Parkhurst himself would be killed by a vehicle when a woman drove her car into a Little League baseball field. The driver rampaged through the field as players and coaches ran toward safety. After driving around the field, the female driver, later identified as Carol Sharrow, attempted to make her way out of the field through a gate on the opposite side. According to media reports, Douglas Parkhurst, who had been walking with a group of children, pushed the children out of the way and tried to close the gate to keep the woman inside the field when he was struck by the vehicle. Douglas would die on his way to the hospital. Carol was arrested and charged with manslaughter. What began as a long-shot Facebook post from a retired yet hopeful detective soon turned to closure for a long grieving family. And while legal justice could not be administered in this case, some might say karmic justice circumvented that issue and possibly saved the lives of some other innocent children in the process. Fifty-seven-year-old Betty Marcel Wheeler was loved by her family, healthy by all accounts, and had the rest of what should have been a very long life ahead of her. She was out on one of her nightly walks when she was tragically struck and killed on April 7, 2012, while walking near Route 40 in Waynesboro, Virginia. She was hit on the side of the road in the northbound lane of Rosser Avenue near P. Buckley Moss Museum. While the driver disappeared from the scene, and seemingly into thin air, in what could only be compared to the tale of Cinderella, they left a small piece of themselves behind. A tiny piece of metal, unique in its design, that would eventually become the key which unlocked the mystery of the cowardly killer. With no leads besides this piece of metal, the police asked the media to release the following statement, quote, can you identify this piece of what looks like a front air dam slash spoiler? If so, you might help catch a killer. This silver piece is a part that came off of the suspect vehicle that fatally struck Betty Marcel Wheeler. Waynesboro Police is asking anyone who knows or sees a vehicle missing a piece that matches the one pictured to contact the Waynesboro Police Department. One Good Samaritan commented on the posted article with a picture of the grill from a Ford F-150 truck. Soon, other online car enthusiasts added their two cents to the thread, agreeing that it certainly did look like the metal piece belonged to that truck make and model, and helped to further narrow it down to the year and possible vehicle special feature packages, also known as the vehicle's trim levels. The online sleuths surmised it to be that of a Ford F-150 truck made in the early 2000s with the XL trim. The website informed police of its users' communal findings, and the Waynesboro police were able to use that information, along with an anonymous tip from the public, to locate a Ford F-150 truck made in the year 2000 with part of its grill missing. Using DMV registration records, police soon were able to arrest Harrisburg, Virginia resident Victor A. Espinoza for failing to report an accident involving injury or death. They later also were able to arrest Juan M. Gonzalez Vasquez for being a passenger in the offending vehicle and, quote, failing to report an accident which resulted in a person being killed or injured. Both suspects were held without bond. Internet sleuths, generous with their time and energy, were able to see their efforts pay off in a very real way, and were even publicly lauded as instrumental in the search process for the car part, especially in cases like these where the offender could have easily had the car repaired to avoid detection. This time-sensitive search is, according to police captain Kelly Walker, akin to, quote, looking for a needle in a haystack. 
But luckily for the Waynesboro Police Department and all of the counties that are positively affected by internet sleuths willing to give their time and effort, if the answers to the world's crimes are merely needles in haystacks waiting to be uncovered, then perhaps the internet and those it connects is the magnet that we've all been waiting for.